pound for a few days. They're not sick, so uh, that kind of eases your mind about where they are. If they didn't say anything to you about being gone, uh, they are out of town. Brother Steve said, uh, I talked to him last night, late last afternoon. He said, you know, getting old is not a bad thing at all. And I said, well, tell me why. He said, well, we're going with Greg and Joy, and Greg's going to do all the driving. I don't have to do anything. We're getting the car and ride. He said, that means when we get in the car and, and, and they say, where do you want to eat? He'll say, well, we're going to eat, Greg, and let him decide. All. He makes all the decisions and drives. And does, so it's not bad getting old at all. That's a good thing. <laughs> all right. We're back in Psalms 131 tonight. We started there last uh, Wednesday evening talking about contentment and rest to very... Very interesting uh, words and uh, certainly uh, uh, two words that uh, most of us would uh, uh, like to find a handle on. How to find contentment and uh, of course uh, when you're contented then you're resting. And uh, uh, my dad used to say you, you can always tell when an old cow is contented uh, standing in the, pa in the pasture. They're standing there. Chewing their could, just just chewing away, contented. Well, you don't see too many contented people in the world today. We're in this section of the book of Psalms that uh, is referred to as a song of degrees. And we have, we have learned as we have studied that that word degrees means a sense, uh, a song of ascent going upward. And uh, the, uh, these psalms were used by... The children of Israel, most Bible scholars believe as they would make their way up to Jerusalem for the various feasts that they celebrated each year. Uh, most likely a good part of that would have involved the years after they came back from their captivity in Babylon. One of the interesting things as I've studied and I've tried to point out to you that uh, I found uh, looking at these Psalms is that uh, they rotate. What I mean by that, they, they go from trouble to trust to triumph. Uh, Psalms 120 is a psalm uh, of trouble. Uh, psalm of uh, 121 is a psalm of trust. Psalms 122 is a psalm of triumph. And then it starts over again. There are five series, uh, three in each section. And our study here in Psalms 131 is the fourth psalm of triumph. It's in the fourth section. We just got one more section to go in, in the 15 psalms that make this up. And uh, uh, th these three verses are, are very interesting. Just a, This is the shortest of all of the 15 psalms that, that make up this section. And yet when you begin to read these verses and, and begin to unpack the truth that's there, just begin to peel off the layers of truth that's there, uh, there, there is some amazing truth to be found in these three verses. In fact, Brother Spurgeon said uh, it is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. What he said, what he's saying is it doesn't take just a, just a moment to read the three verses, but, but then to come back and dwell upon its truth and try to apply it in our hearts and to learn by it then that's something else altogether. Let, let's read the verses and then we'll pray and, and then we'll come back and review just a moment and, and then I'll give you a couple of final points on these verses. Notice how uh, David begins. This is uh, a psalm that is ascribed to David, a song of degrees of David. Notice how he begins, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great manners or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word and I pray, Lord, for your touch and your blessing and the ministering presence of the Holy Spirit. Without you, Lord, um, then I'm nothing here this evening. And I pray you'd help me to be able to communicate what I've studied, what, what I believe you want me to share with your people. And I pray you'd use it in our hearts and lives and help us to grow and become what you want us to be. And 
Lord, to experience the contentment and rest that you desire for us to have in our lives uh, of God's people. The entirety of this psalm deals with the, the subject, the difficult subject of humility. Humility. Somebody said, well, preacher, look at that. David is bragging about his humility. No, no, look, look how he begins. Lord, my heart is not haughty. Now, if David had been uh, talking to someone else, then we could have accused him of, of being boastful about, uh, about his humility. But he's talking to God, and David certainly understands that God knows his heart. And, and uh, to me, the surprise in these three verses, the thing that, that, that just uh, is amazing in these three verses is the fact that, that God's victory, God's triumph, God's success in life looks a lot different than the success, the triumph, the victory that the world talks about today. And David is warning us here about the sin of pride. And the encouragement that he gives us here is that this rest, this contentment, can only be found in humility in our lives by living in a position, by, by taking a position of humility in our lives. Now David... Not always. David was a man uh, of, of, of passions, just as I am and you are, subject to all the temptations that we are. And David had his struggles in life. But uh, in many ways, in many different places, David exemplified this matter uh, of humility. Perhaps the greatest area of that is seen as, as uh, Saul is hunting him and seeking to take his life. And there were times... During all of that, when David could have easily taken the life of Saul, nobody would have blamed him for that. The soldiers would have rallied behind him. The country would have rallied behind him. But, but, but David knew that God had anointed him king and that at the right time, in the right place, then God would put him on the throne. And he was not going to subject himself to being prideful in, in an attempt to take that position. He was going to allow God to work through all of that. And so uh, he, he learned humility in his life. And with that humility came uh, contentment. I asked you last week as we began looking at this, if you were sitting down writing a description of your soul, of your, of your being, your internal being, I'm not talking about what you <laughs> want me to believe about you or your wife or your kids or somebody else, but I'm talking about what you know to be true about you. How, how would you describe your soul tonight? Would you describe it as quiet? Or would you describe it as disturbed? Would you describe it as restful or would you describe it as turbulent? Now, I know and you know there are a number of reasons why uh, we're not restful in this world. Sometimes uh, there's a lack of contentment in our lives and we're disturbed and agitated because we're dealing with guilt. Guilt over sin in our lives. We, 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 we're, we're not right with God. I, I don't mean... I don't mean we're necessarily uh, what we like to categorize as out and way out in sin somewhere, but we know we're not walking with God and, and we're not right with the Lord. And, and probably uh, most of the time when that happens, we find ourselves not right with others somewhere along the way. Sometimes that lack of contentment comes because we're worried about something or someone that we have no control over at all. It may be, maybe, maybe we're discontented because we're envious. It's easy in this world today, if you're not careful, to get envious of other people. Uh, as you see, seemingly an injustice as some folks suffer who are struggling to live for God. And then to, those who are not seem to just uh, have a bounty of things. Well, you need to remember that that's all they'll ever have. The best is yet ahead for children of God. You, you and I are living... Uh, the, the, the most impoverished life we'll ever live here in this world. The best is yet ahead for you and I tonight. Sometimes we're discontented because of physical difficulty in our lives or we're emotionally fatigued. Sometimes uh, uh, a chronic illness can cause discontent or, or frustration in our lives. So there are a lot of things in the world that can bring those things, but... It is God's desire, it, above all else in our lives, we're talking about Christian people now, those who, who know Christ as their Savior, it's God's desire 
For us to have a quiet heart, God wants our soul to be at rest. No matter what's going on around us, God wants us to be at rest. The Bible tells us that if there is unrest, if there is discontentment in our lives, then probably it has to do with the attitude of pride in our lives. And in these three short verses, uh, uh, the psalmist talks about that and, and gives us some very practical things to help us. Three steps here that, that I, I want to mention and talk about. We talked about this first one last Wednesday night. Number one, we need to practice humility in our lives. In other words, we need to put forth an effort to live a humble life. And certainly we see that here in this first verse in, in the psalmist. He, he lifts his voice to the Lord. He cries out to God here, addressing the Lord. And uh, humility in our lives always begins by focusing on the Lord and who he is. If you ever see him as he is and who he is, then you're going to recognize that you're nothing. I mean, we're just a speck. We're not even a speck in all that God has created. Everything that follows in this verse takes place within that text of his opening cry, Lord. We talked about it. He gives us three things here to be, be aware of. First of all, be aware of a haughty heart. The word haughty here means high, lofty, high up. And uh, that, that, that word is used in reference of having... Uh, a, a heart of pride about ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about a good kind of pride. I believe, I believe, uh, I believe there's a good pride and a bad pride. I, I believe you ought to be conscious uh, of you, you, yourself as a Christian, and you ought to hold yourself as a Christian wherever you are. I, I, believe, I believe that I have a responsibility as a part of my family uh, to, to present a, 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 a good picture of my family and what I've been taught as a family. I, I can remember my mom uh, uh, saying to me as a boy growing up, what, uh, what people see in you, they're going to think about your parents and your home. And uh, there's a good kind of pride, but there's a bad kind of pride. When we see ourselves as, as being high and lifted up and, and better than other people, well, we need to practice humility. How, how, do, how do we do that? Well, it starts with the heart. The, the psalmist, or the writer of Proverbs said in Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And then the, the psalmist said in Psalm 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Beware of a haughty heart. Be, be careful about that. Number two, beware of lofty eyes. He says, nor mine eyes lofty. The word lofty there means to rise up or, or, or to raise. And in other words, uh, you, you, the, the, word, the word lofty there means the, the, the lifting up of an object there. Uh, there's a good lifting up of the eyes as, as we saw in Psalms 121. I lift up my, my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. We ought to lift our eyes up to the Lord. and There's not anything wrong with that at all. But, it, but, but, but there's wrong when we lift up our eyes to look down on other people. No matter what our position in life is. The, the greatest people I know who, uh, and the most influential people that I know, are, are people who recognize who they are and where they are, and they don't look down on other people. They don't talk down to other people. We live in a world today when there's so much of that that goes on. Proverbs 20 and verse 13, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. I want to tell you, it, it takes every, every individual that God has created in this world to keep this world going. God needs electricians and he needs plumbers and he needs garbage men. He needs waitresses. He needs housewives. He needs carpenters. Uh, he needs, I mean, listen, listen, it takes all of that uh, for God's world to operate. And, and, and we have no business looking down on, on other people. If the hearty heart, a uh, haughty heart has to do with pride in relation to ourselves, then lofty eyes has to do with pride in relation to others. But then uh, he mentions something else in this verse. Not only a, a, a haughty heart, a lofty eyes, but uh, a lordly mind. Look at the last part of this verse. Neither do I exercise myself in great manners or in things too high for me. And that has to do with the attitude of feeling as though you've got to know or understand everything. You've got to be an expert on everything. 
And uh, boy, you, you're going to rest a whole lot better when you lay your head on your pillow tonight if you realize that just a whole lot you don't know about what's going on in the world. And the quicker you ad admit that to yourself and to others around you, the better off you're going to be. The psalmist is saying, I'm willing to admit that there are things I cannot do and, 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 and many things I don't understand. David, very simply put, in the latter part of this verse, David is saying, I quit trying to play God. Now, a lot of folks trying to play God in this world are the lives of other people. I, listen, I can pray for other people and pray that God would work in the lives of other people, but I cannot play God in somebody else's life. The sad thing is most of us don't make very good human beings, and we sure don't make good gods. I can tell you that right now. So in order for, for us to practice humility, we've got to be aware of a haughty heart and lofty eyes and a lordly mind. But then notice secondly here in verse number two, I believe he's talking about learning contentment. Look at it. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. And in that verse... Uh, He's talking about what happens when you practice humility. When you practice humility, you learn contentment, which, by the way, involves effort. You don't learn anything without effort. I, I, I remember uh, in, in high school thinking, boy, you know, because it, 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 computers were just coming along when, when I finished high school. I mean, the computer in those days would have taken a, a, a room half as big as this building for a computer. But, but I thought, boy, it had been great if God had, God had put a cap on top of our heads and they could have taken a Phillips screwdriver and taken it off and just put everything in that we needed to know. <laughs> but it didn't happen like that. I didn't learn 2 plus 2 equals 4 until I'd written, on, written it on the board. I don't know how many times. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't know how to divide fractions until I'd stood at the board and written those things time and time again. Well, you're not going to learn contentment without effort in your life. And he gives us three instructions in this verse about learning contentment. How, how, do, how do we learn contentment? Number one, be still before the Lord. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. The word behaved here means to make still or level, to, to equalize. The, the word refers to, to a ceasing from motion, being still. Picture in your mind with that word a, a rough sea with waves that are chopping up and down. If you saw pictures of the hurricane coming into uh, to, uh, the area there around New Orleans, the waves and, and, and the rolling seas. I mean, it was awful, chopping up and down. That, that's a picture of discontent. It's a picture of restless in our, restlessness in our lives. And then, then imagine... The still surface of a lake or a pond, just, just like a piece of glass almost. That's exactly what that word means there. Still. Being still before the Lord. David is talking here about calming or soothing our soul. And, and there's no way to calm or to soothe your soul unless you get still before the Lord. What he's saying here is that he has eliminated those things that agitate his soul. He, he has put those things away. The, those very things we just looked at in verse number one, pride in self, pride towards others, and pride towards God, he's eliminated those things. Well, if you want to learn real contentment, you, you need to do the same things in your life. You need to level your soul before God and smooth out all the conflicting emotions in your life and, and just, just give yourself to the Lord. Part of that is being still before Him. Acknowledging that He's God and you're not. Let me, let me ask you, have you noticed today how nobody wants to be where it's quiet? Wherever you go, there's got to be noise. You get in the elevator, they got music in the elevator. You go to the restaurant, they got music in the restaurant. You go to the gas station, oh my, you never know what you're going to find at the gas station if you have to 
if, you, if you're so unfortunate, you have to go inside. Everywhere you go. And, and it's the same way at home. What will what be the very first thing you do when you get home tonight? You're going to grab, go, grab that remote control and turn the television on. Most folks, if you're not in that crowd, then, then, then I can tell you, you are, you're, you're not of the normal bunch. I can tell you that. And these kids... I don't, know what, I, don't know what, I don't know what this generation of young people are going to do in the days ahead. I really don't. They got to have ear pods in their ears and they got to be doing, and, and you, they, listen, you got to scream at them to even get them to hear you. I, I've watched going down the road, I, I'll hear a siren from an ambulance and, and I'll see kids and, and uh, young people in front of me. And I'm not talking about Matthew's age, I'm talking about young adults. And they got, they got one or two in their ear and the sirens are blaring and everybody else is pulling over and they're just driving along like there's nobody in the world but them. Why? Because they got all that noise in their ears. If you want to learn contentment, you're going to have to learn to be still before the Lord. You, you can't hear God speaking to you if you don't get still in His presence. Psalms chapter 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Well, I'm telling you, the devil is a master of placing things before us today to take our attention away from being still before God. And, 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 and let me tell you, it doesn't have to be bad things. It may not at all be bad things. But in reality, anything that keeps us from being still before the Lord is bad. So if you want to learn contentment, be still before the Lord. Then secondly, you need to quiet your soul. Look at it again. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. That word quieted means to be motionless. It means to be silent. So David has stilled his soul. There, there is no more agitation. He has quieted his soul. There's no more crying out. A, a quiet soul comes from only one place, and that, that's from the hand of God. It's his gift to us. Some of you in, the, in this room tonight could testify to what I'm about to say. You have lost loved ones. And you know what happens when someone that is so dear to your heart is suddenly gone through the door of death. And you think, I will never have, I'll never be able to get beyond this. And, and I've talked to dear ladies who've lost their husbands. And, and uh, I've had them say, I'd hear a song and all of a sudden it would just flash up. But then I've also heard them talk about how that in time as God helped and God gave grace through all of that, God brought the gift of, of quietness to their soul, brought a peace to their soul. Psalm 62 and verse 1, the, the psalmist said, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. Listen, you better learn to go to God for quietness in your soul because there will be a time, if you make it through this life into eternity without reaching that place where you don't need God's help and some quietness in your soul, you're, you're going to be abnormal. You're not going to be like the normal person in this world. Thank the Lord tonight. Our blessed Lord offers rest for every soul who comes to him. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You want rest for your soul? Then come to the Lord Jesus. He, he wants to give us that rest. When we practice humility, we learn contentment. And part of learning that contentment has to do with learning, uh, with, with having a still and a quiet soul before the Lord. But, but then notice the last part of this verse. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. How? As a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. We need to rest like a weaned child with his mother. Now, now notice the last part of that verse. He repeats the same phrase twice. 
often that, that's done in the Word of God and, 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 and the Lord doesn't waste words. The reason He does that twice is to emphasize the importance of what He's saying here. We, we need to rest like a child, like a weaned child with its mother. I, I, I sat and thought about some good words to, to describe a child when it's being weaned. If you have children, then you identify with this. When a child is being weaned, they're restless. They're agitated. And most of the time, they're very noisy. I mean very noisy. Everybody's going to know about what's going on. Well, that's the exact opposite of, of the still and quiet soul that he's talking about here. Here in this psalm, David has come through this process. He, he has come through that process of agitation and, and, and that process of, uh, of being restless. And, and he's reached the end of that. He's reached that place where he is finding complete contentment in the Lord. There was a time when he was more like a screaming baby. But now he's like a weaned child. He finally realizes that, that he doesn't need what he thought he needed before. How am I ever going to get by without my bottle? I can't, I can't go on without my bottle. i got to have my bottle. But he suddenly realized that in life, he can get by without that. And like a weaned child, he's found contentment and rest. Just that weaned child when it begins to learn that real contentment comes from mama, <laughs> being there with mama. Now, now that weaned child has forgotten about the, the, the bottle and the milk and, and is finding contentment being in the presence of the mother. David is saying that's exactly what happened to me. I, I've gone through all this. I thought I had to have this. And I thought I had to have that. I thought I had to have that over yonder and this over here and all this in my life. But all of a sudden, I found what I really needed was the presence of my Heavenly Father. Amen. And the picture of a weaned child here is a picture of perfect peace and contentment. What used to provoke fussing and used to provoke crying, what used to bring about desperation, no longer affects him. You see, when you let go of your pride and you're comparing and you're trying to run your own life and the lives of others, then and only then are you going to find contentment in the Lord. Because then you're fi trying to find that con content contentment in Christ. If you think about it, winning is a child's first experience of loss. First time in their life that they, they find out they can't have everything that they want. I, in a real way, that's the very first time in their life. <laughs> they just, you know, life in front of me is not going to be getting everything I want. I mean, my bottle's gone. And I can tell you one of the hardest lessons to learn in life is that you're not always going to get what you want. And you cannot always have your way. And I, I see folks every day who still haven't learned that lesson. And they're, they're full of discontentment. They're full of unrest. And what David is saying here in this verse is that this is a weaning process. It's a, it's a battle. Ask a parent who's gone through weaning a child. They'll tell you it's a battle. And I want to tell you it's a battle for God to bring us to a place of contentment and rest in our lives. The weaned child has learned to be content with the mother. And you and I as God's children are to, learn to be, uh, are to learn to be content with God. You see, God doesn't want us to grow, grow up as Christians being childish. Now, He wants us to have childlike faith, but he doesn't, want us, he doesn't want us to be childish in our lives. In other words, like a child putting his trust in his parents, we're putting our complete trust in Him. We're no longer fighting. We're no longer clawing for the things of this world. But we're depending on him to meet our needs. The restful, the contented state of the believer is in total contrast to the restlessness of the wicked. 
Remember Isaiah's words in Isaiah 57, 20, 21. He said, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And no peace for the wicked in this world. But there's peace and contentment available for the child of God. So what are we to do? We're to stop our struggling. We're to stop our restlessness. We're to be still before the Lord. We're to quiet our soul. We're to practice humility. We're to learn contentment. And he's got one more verse. Look at it. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Not only should we practice humility and learn contentment, but we're to live in hope. David's closing words here are for his people, the nation of Israel, that they live in hope. And that verse is really an invitation for Israel to put their hope in the Lord now and forever. But if you look carefully at that verse, it's not only a verse of instruction for Israel, but it's a verse of instruction for every one of us. Not only is Israel to put their hope in the Lord, but you and I, where are we going to put our hope? We're to put our hope in the Lord. There's no other place to put our hope in. It's not there. Somebody said, oh, I'd be so glad when 2022 gets here and we're going to vote out all the problems. Well, you know what? I'll be 80 years old in November, and I've been hearing that ever since I've been old enough to go to polls and vote, Brother Larry. And instead of voting all the problems out, it just seems like our problems grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. And we vote somebody in that we think is not going to be a problem and they don't stay there long until they're a problem. I can tell you tonight, our, our hope's not in this world or the people of this world. Our hope's in the Lord. And, and, and the Lord tonight is inviting you and I to share the same peaceful rest that the psalmist has, has enjoyed and is enjoying here in these verses. And that, uh, that is peace and restfulness in the Lord. Well, he said, that's fantasy land. You won't see that anywhere unless you, uh, unless you spend your money and go to Disney World. Well, you won't even see it there. I can tell you that. But it's not, it's not fantasy land. It's a place of reality for those who know the Lord. The, those who are seeking him first and foremost in their lives. What did Jesus say? We, we use this verse over and over again. And, and we, just, we, we blow off its truth. But it's reality. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Where are we to put our hope? We're to put our hope in the Lord. Well, when are we to put our hope in the Lord? He said, from henceforth and forever. We're to put our hope in the Lord now and we're to put our hope in the Lord forevermore. Look back to Psalms 121. Look at verses 7 and 8. Psalms 121, verses 7 and 8. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Look at 125 and verse 2. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. The words from henceforth tell us that we can trust the Lord for our present needs. Right now, I can trust the Lord for the needs that I have this very moment. But not only can I trust the Lord for my needs at this very moment, but I can trust the Lord for my needs from henceforth forever. There will never be a time in my life that the Lord will not be taking care of my needs, that he will not provide for my needs. Only three verses, three short verses in this psalm. But would you say that they're packed with truth? Would you, would you say that they're literally, they're literally compacted with truth? Those who practice humility before the Lord are those who find contentment and rest. 
But when we are proud in our hearts, when we're arrogant in our attitude towards others, and when we demand to be like God, know everything, then our hearts are going to be restless and full of discontent. So the question comes, are you looking for quiet and restfulness in your soul? Then what you need to do to begin with is confess your pride. Lord, deal with the pride in my life. You need to repent of a soul that is proud. If you've got a proud attitude some, towards somebody else, you think you're better. Let me tell you tonight, just about every, every day I see this same old fella. He lives on the streets. He lives on the streets here in Rossville, Nova Fort Oglethorpe. Black, black fellow with a long, white, dirty, dirty beard. Did you know the only thing between where he is and where I am tonight is the grace of God. That's all. Just the grace of God. There is but one thing between you and I in that place tonight, and that's God's grace. So I don't have anything in the world tonight to be proud of where I am. The only thing I can exalt is the grace of Almighty God tonight. And you know the wonderful thing is, what God did for me, He'd do for that man the very moment He'd give His heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want restfulness, you want contentment, practice humility, learn contentment, live in hope. Samuel Cox, in, in his uh, commentary on this psalm, uh, wrote a, and I, and I close with it tonight, he wrote a, a, a beautiful summary of, of the psalm. He said, all too often we're guilty of busying ourselves with things too great and wonderful for us. And hence it is that we are so restless and perturbed. There is no peace but in the humility that leans on God, which trusts in Him, which confesses weakness and ignorance and guilt, which is not ashamed to say, I do not know, I cannot tell, which rejoices not in the faults and defects of others, but rejoices in whatever is true in them and good and kind. Only as we recover the spirit of a little child, of a weaned child, and rest in simple, lowly faith in God, shall we enter into the peace which passeth all understanding. There are going to be a lot of things that you and I are going to be regretful about when we get to heaven. You say, oh, well, everything's going to be perfect there. Well, we've got to go to the judgment seat of Christ before we get on over there to, 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 to that, that perfect land where all that's gone. and He wipes away all tears. But I'm telling you, a lot of us are going to find out that we spent a lot of fitful nights and a lot of restful days simply because we're not willing to trust the Lord and put things in His hands and find the contentment we need there. Would you bow your head with me tonight? I had to get on my knees after I studied this. I, I, read, I read these three verses and I thought, what in the world am I looking at here? And I read, and began to look at the words and then I began to read what others said and the more I read, the more conviction came and the more I realized, oh my dear Lord, I'm living. I'm living in a place where I ought not to be living. I need this rest and contentment in my life. Father, bless these moments of commitment, these moments of uh, praying and hearts and lives all over this room tonight. Some of us have children tonight, grandchildren tonight that are frustrated and restless because they haven't come here. And Lord, I pray, I pray you'd help us to remember them tonight. And help us to see ourselves tonight as we are in our needs, Father. Meet every need in this room as we're honest with you in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me for a moment?